uh, that wasn't mentioned is that, that you could see that that was an explosion. It happened all at once. It happened very quickly, and then it was over. Well, inside of living cells, it's important for reactions to occur on a more continuous time scale, not, not in an explosive manner, which might be cited as another difference. So let's move now from the realm of chemistry to some of these biochemical reactions. And I would like to start out by just reminding you of something that you all know, which is that in living cells, information is stored in the form of deoxyribonucleic acid, the famous double helix of DNA. And when I talk about information, I mean information that tells a cell how to build a particular protein, shown over here on the right. And how is this information that's stored in the chromosomal DNA uh, eventually used to design a particular protein? Well, the DNA is first copied into a chemically rather similar molecule called ribonucleic acid, or RNA, and then groups of three of the building blocks of RNA. And as you know, these building blocks come in four what I like to call flavors. There's an A, a G, a C, and a U in the RNA, and different triplets encode a particular amino acid. For example, uh, A followed by U followed by G encodes a methionine, three U's in a row encodes a phenylalanine, etc. And so the order of the building blocks, these individual units along the RNA molecule, as copied from, directly from the DNA molecule, determines the order of amino acids that are laid down into this chain of protein and the order of the amino acids, in turn, determines the way that the protein folds up, which will determine the function that the protein has. For example, a protein might be the protein pepsin, which is an enzyme in your stomach that's digesting your breakfast right now. And that pepsin has a particular gene that specifies production of that protein. Or myosin is another protein that's involved in muscle movement. The myosin protein will have a, a particular stretch of DNA that encodes or specifies the construction of the myosin protein. Now, a simple everyday analogy would be that the DNA is like a, an archival master copy of your favorite videotape. So you've got one of those masters, and from that you can copy a limitless number of copies of the tape, which in terms of their information have the same information as the master copy. That's the RNA equivalent. Then you need some kind of a machine to plug the videotape into, and that's a VCR machine, which is analogous to the cell's ribosome, which is its protein synthetic machinery, where the... Uh, amino acids are lined up with the triplet codons along the RNA using this transfer RNA intermediary. And then finally, you, need, you have the final output of this series of events, which is in the terms of a videotape, an image on the television monitor. And that is equivalent then to the uh, functional protein that's produced from this chain of events in the cell. Now, over the next few lectures, we're going to have um, a slightly less even view of these three molecules involved in information transfer. So you can see RNA is now uh, in the big green letters because RNA, like DNA, has the ability to carry and store biological information. But what's been found more recently is that RNA shares with protein the ability to be an enzyme or to catalyze biochemical reactions. And it's this dual life or double life of RNA that's going to be the topic of the lectures coming up. I think it's very useful to get a picture of what these molecules look like because their function and structure are intimately connected. And so let's start with uh, looking at a picture of a protein, in this case a protein which catalyzes a reaction on a small sugar molecule. This is a, uh, first of all, you can see in terms of the number of atoms involved, it's huge compared to the oxygen and the hydrogen that we used in the first chemical demonstration. 
Uh, it's a large globular molecule. This one has a molecular weight of many tens of thousands rather than just a molecular weight of, of under 100. Uh, it has an active site cleft, which envelops a small sugar molecule in this case. And then there are chemical groups provided by the protein, which uh, in a way encourage the small molecule to undergo a very specific sort of chemical transformation, and that's the catalytic step. So this is a protein. Now, if you ask the question, well, you know, could a nucleic acid, is it reasonable that a nucleic acid could be a catalyst as well? If you start out with the type of nucleic acid that you're used to thinking about, the one that is uh, highlighted the most in your high school biology text, you think about the double helix of DNA, and it seems to have a very different sort of structure. It's not globular at all. You can see that even from this short stretch of DNA, but this amount of DNA would not be enough to encode a protein. A gene at this scale would have to extend clear off the screen, wrap all the way around this auditorium in order to uh, be long enough to have enough information to specify the production of a protein. So this molecule, instead of being a glob, is much more like spaghetti. It's a long, thin molecule, and in fact, I'm reminded of the videotape analogy again. This is the cell's videotape, and like a videotape, it's a linear, rather regularly structured uh, molecule, very well suited for storage of biological information. Now, when we move from DNA to RNA, we move from a double-stranded molecule to a molecule that has a single nucleic acid chain, but that single chain can be folded back on itself, as shown here in the case of transfer RNA, to form helical regions, but also more complex structures, such as a, uh, a very intricately folded region here, a hole in the molecule, an indentation at this point, a place where the chain turns around and forms a loop. Down at the bottom, a single-stranded extension over on this end, which carries the amino acid. And so RNA, although single-stranded, isn't necessarily structureless. In fact, we think of RNA quite the opposite, that the RNA takes on uh, a variety of structures that are critical to its biological function. And finally, when we move from transfer RNA to a type of RNA molecule which is known to have catalytic activity, we see a structure that has quite a few helical regions packed together in a very specific way. And this molecule um, is shown here as a framework so that you can see, peer inside of the helices and see the overall architecture of the molecule. But if we looked at this, as we will later, in the form of a space-filling model where you can see all of the atoms, you would have trouble from where you're sitting telling the difference between this catalytic RNA and the globular shape of the protein enzyme that I showed you earlier. And so uh, let's now continue comparing and contrasting chemical and biochemical catalysis by doing a, another demonstration. This one, which I like to call Mr. Lincoln Glows, the Mr. Lincoln here is a Lincoln penny, which of course is made out of copper and what we have in the beaker is some acetone, which is a simple organic compound. And just so that I'm careful to follow my own safety rules here, I'll put on the safety goggles. And the acetone can undergo a decomposition reaction. It can break down. But this happens extremely slowly under normal circumstances. So that acetone, in fact, would all evaporate uh, into the air of the auditorium long before we would get uh, any significant decomposition.